Luke chapter 3. Before we get into it, uh, John mentioned our GCLI classes, GCLI, Great Commission Leadership Institute. Uh, these are materials that were made by the Great Commission, the, the organization we belong to, uh, for the purpose of raising up pastors. Well, the material is so good, we thought we'd widen it out in our whole leadership team, our deacons and, and our treasurer and those, uh, well, our treasurer is a deacon, our uh, secretary is what I meant to say, uh, and, and others who are, are uh, apprenticing on the leadership team, everyone is in that class you don't just have to be a pastor. And then we liked it so much, we thought, you know what? This material is so good, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody in the church got to come and, and hear it? So we're opening this up. Uh, the GCI materials, they're, they're, like I said, like John said, they're written to prepare people for the pastorate. However, uh, we just want anybody who wants to come and get some, not only some good teaching, but also these are some complicated issues and maybe you're curious where our church comes down on some of these issues. Uh, you'll learn about that. And so really want to open this up to anybody who has a desire, who will be seriously committed, who can take that time. Uh, set aside that 75 bucks. It's, it's a big commitment, and I, I want it to be a big commitment because when you pay the $75, you're more likely to be there each time. And uh, attendance is required. Take it seriously. But... Think about this, 45 to 50 minutes twice a month is not onerous. 45 to 50 minutes a month is not very many, what's that? Two, three Gilligan's Islands? It, it's not that big a deal uh, in a month. There's preparation time at home as well, but you can have Gilligan's Island on in the background if you like. Uh, the textbooks are $75, not a piece, but for the set of four. But the Great Commission isn't trying to make a bunch of money off of them. So although I strongly encourage each person to, to, uh, each, uh, person to get the materials, they're going to be excellent resources to have on your bookshelf. Uh, if you're a family or if you're a couple, why don't you order one set? And then the Great Commission is, is, uh, has the downloads for free. You can, you can print them up, copy them off. One person can order the book, and you can just copy off that if you like. Uh, so I would recommend for married couples, you, you only have to buy one set. And even the $10 CDs, I call them up and they, they encourage. They, in fact, they've tried to tell me, don't buy more audio CDs, just copy them. Uh, so they've given us permission to uh, copy all the audio CDs we want. Uh, again, uh, but if you'd like to have the nice box that they come in, it's only $10. It's a, it's a, it's a steal, but Dwayne, don't literally steal it. Uh, <laughs> Again, uh, for, the, for GCI, their thing is, is uh, teaching this out, not making a bunch of money on it. So this is going to be a great, great class. I can't imagine uh, anybody uh, sitting through this and thinking, well, I wish I'd never signed up for this. Uh, theology is a theo, teos, a deo, the study of God, right? The study of God, like geology is the study of, you know, this is the study of God. So it's a beautiful, it's a wonderful thing, and uh, that's going to be on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to about 7.20, and then, uh, boy, I'd like a whole bunch of people to sign up for that. Today's message is uh, got three titles. First one, Lights, Camera, Action. Second one, Luke sets the stage for the public ministry of Jesus Christ. So Luke is putting together his gospel in such a way <clears throat> that right now he's setting the final slate, stage, lights, camera, action, for Jesus Christ to arise on the to arrive on the scene and uh, to fulfill his, his ministry. And then the third title is, brothers and sisters, live for the applause of heaven. Live for the applause of heaven. Luke chapter 3, and let's take a look at the uh, first couple verses. Luke chapter 3, 1 and 2. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Tiberius Caesar ruled from about 14 to 37 AD. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of uh, Ituria and uh, Traconitus, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. So he's giving all of these names. Why? 
Because Luke said he's investigated everything, and he wants to give us a clear picture, and he's setting this firmly in time. This is a historical event. These are all these famous, uh, well, various degrees of fame, fame, obviously. The emperor was the most famous. Uh, all of these important figures in uh, giving their location and their time to let us know exactly when this happened. During the high priesthood of uh, Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zach, in the wilderness. Uh, well, if you know anything about the scriptures, if you don't know anything about the scriptures, you just heard a bunch of names and a bunch of places, and that was fine. But if you know anything, you know that this passage is a little bit confusing. Because you're thinking, Herod, is this the same Herod that had all the babies killed when Jesus Christ was, uh, was an infant? Uh, no, this is actually, the Herod mentioned here is actually one of his sons. This Herod is one of the sons of Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great was a client king of the Roman Empire. And this Herod was known as Herod Antipas. So after his death, the land ruled by Herod the Great was divided into parcels. Herod Antipas ruled Galilee uh, to the north of Jerusalem. One of his brothers was Herod Philip, uh, tetrarch of Eturia and Trachonitis, which were parts of modern-day Syria and Lebanon. Then you have the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who ruled Judea, and a fellow named Licinius, it's a Latin name, who is Tetrarch of uh, Abilene, which was near Damascus in Syria. It was a small location. This is confusing to people because there was an earlier Licinius that ruled a large territory, and he was the son of a famous Roman, I believe, general. In 41 AD, after the death and resurrection of Christ, right? 41 AD, so after the death and resurrection of Christ, Herod Agrippa unites much of this territory under his rule, and he is the Herod that's mentioned in the book of Acts. So we've got three different Herods going on, and they're all different people. Uh, now, there has been a problem with this character named Licinius. And probably most of you have never heard this, but I'm going to go over it quickly in case you have. History has very little record on Licinius. And this has caused some scholars in the past to question whether Luke knew what he was talking about. And the idea is, we know about this famous Licinius, but he lived 50 years before this time. He ruled a large territory. He had coins minted. We've got his, the coins with his name on them. Uh, Luke must have been written much later, and he just drew a name. He didn't know what he was talking about. Well, one, it, he couldn't have been written that much later because the early church fathers quote from Luke, and we've talked about this a lot. But the idea is Luke didn't know what he was talking about and that he made a mistake. We only have a few records of Pontius Pilate. At one time, people even doubted Pontius Pilate existed, but thankfully we have records of Pontius Pilate. Even though he was a Roman governor, there's not much on him. He was mentioned by the great historian Josephus. Remember, Luke is also acting as a historian here. But Licinius was a tetrarch, which is a Greek division. Originally, it meant four, but under Roman times, it didn't necessarily mean four. Uh, when you take a territory and you divide it into parcels, each one of these kind of like sub-kings or little kings is called a, a tetrarch. Uh, and outside of a brief mention by Josephus, we can't find any ancient historian who mentions him. So how is this possible? Well, one, I really take issue with somebody who's doubting Licinius when you have two ancient historians, Luke and Josephus, both mentioning him. But that's not good enough for some people, and it does get worse. Again, a man with a similar name, more famous, who ruled over a large area about 50 years before this time, but Luke mentions this second Licinius around 27 to 29 AD. So despite the fact that we've got Luke and the Jewish historian Josephus, some have assumed that Luke mistakenly used the name from the man who lived 50 years earlier. Well, I've got some good news, as if we needed more confirmation. We already got Luke. We already have Josephus. Uh, archaeologists, archaeologists have found an inscription in a pagan temple that was written in the time of Emperor Tiberius, so the same time, that mentions uh, Licinius and calls him Tetrarch of Abilea, Abilea near Damascus. So that's exactly what we were looking for. Uh, the Bible gets confirmed again and again, but before, before that temple inscription was found, you had to say, this book is rock solid in everything that I've ever come across. This book is rock solid. It's historically accurate. 
It's powerful to my own soul, cutting between the bones and the marrow. And if there's some debate on this, I'm going to go with the historian Luke because he's been so accurate in the past. Before we found the temple inscription, and if you were unaware that Josephus confirms, uh, Josephus actually mentions both Licinius's, so that's cool. Uh, you would have had to put your faith in this work because it's so rock solid. But it is nice, again and again, that uh, archaeologists have discovered information that backs up exactly what Luke was saying. Another thing that people uh, sometimes use to assault the gospel record is to ask the following question. The New Testament sometimes identifies the high priest as uh, Annas and sometimes as Caiaphas. And then they say, this is an obvious contradiction. Isn't that interesting? I've had people say that to me. The Bible must be con contradicting because this passage said the high priest is Annas and this uh, passage said the high priest is Caiaphas. But what do I always teach here? What do I always say to help us think through these things? An apparent contradiction is not the same thing as a necessary contradiction. An apparent contradiction is not the same thing as a necessary contradiction. If there are plausible explanations, then it's not a contradiction. And this is an easy one. Look at right here. Luke, in verse 2, mentions both Annas and Caiaphas in the same sentence. Obviously, the guy who's writing in the first century did not think he was writing a contradiction. Otherwise, he would not have included both names. Uh, he saw no contradiction. And as I said last time, when we taught on, when we went through this, uh, we, t we discussed this in an earlier message, uh, Annas had been appointed the high priest by the Roman, Roman governor, Quirinius. Remember Quirinius? We talked about him before. Annas was deposed by another Roman official <coughs> when he was only 36. So he's a young high priest to lose his job. And that happened in 15 AD. The Jewish people still respected Annas. And so they were still following him, and he kind of was the power behind the throne. And the, following, the pre high priests that followed him were kind of uh, like puppet rulers. The next six high priests were all controlled by Annas, and there's a reason for why that was easy for him. Five of them were his sons. And one of them, Caiaphas, was his son-in-law. Come on! If you want to point out contradictions in the scripture, you've got to do better than that. But this is another example where at face value, people said, oh, that's a contradiction. How come the Bible sometimes says it's Annas and sometimes says it's Caiaphas? And you just do a little bit of research. Please, it doesn't take that long. You do a little bit of research and you find out there is no contradiction whatsoever. So the Bible talks about two high priests because there was, in effect, two high priests. Some modern people looking to find things to poke holes at uh, are looking for an excuse to call something a contradiction, but independent history confirms Luke's historical record again. All right, let's look at Luke 3, 3 through 6. He, we're talking about the young John the Baptist, okay? This prophet, remember I said John the Baptist is like a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's like an Old Testament prophet. He went uh, into all the country around the Jordan, preach, the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So his message wasn't believe God and everything's happy. Believe God and, and uh, you could be richer than Bill Gates or whatever. His message is repent, repent. You need your sins to be dealt with. And brothers and sisters, that's the message that our world needs to hear. And sometimes all we want to bring to them is, come to church, we have pizza. Come to church, we have uh, a really fun Sunday school class. Uh, come to church, we eat together a lot. That's, a good, that's good. Brothers and sisters, all those things, as good as they may be, and they're part of fellowship, and they're part of enjoying our relationship with the Lord, part of enjoying one another, right? But all of those things mean nothing unless people's sins are being dealt with. He came, this mighty man of God, came preaching a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We need our sins dealt with. And if somebody's going to get scared away because you talk about sin, well, they weren't going to stick around long anyways. 
when somebody's heart is being touched by the Holy Spirit and they see, wait, I don't want to make excuses for my sins anymore. I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to justify myself. What I need is forgiveness. I need somebody just to love me as I am. I need somebody who will see me at my worst and still care about me. When somebody's at that moment, then trust me, preaching the truth is not going to scare them away. Bring this message, repentance. Bring this message, forgiveness. And let the Holy Spirit do its work. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, so Isaiah the prophet prophesied about John the Baptist the prophet. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. And you can think of that as uh, every Bible-believing church in the middle of modern America or wherever they are around the world, every Bible-believing church, and in some countries there's just a handful of churches. And in, and in some places like Japan, the average church is like 10, 11, 12, 15 people. Every church is this little spark of light in a dark place. It's like a voice calling out in this vast desolation, this wilderness. Come, come to the Lord, come to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, you've heard me say this a lot. In your workplace, you may be the only Christian there. You may be a voice in the wilderness. How about at school? Maybe a lot of kids, there's probably some believers there. Maybe some of them are ashamed of it or embarrassed. There are a lot of kids there who need Jesus, and you may be the only voice. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. In your neighborhood, you may be a voice in the wilderness. We need to be this voice. People need to hear. People need to know. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the paths for him. For every valley shall be filled in, and every mountain and hill made low. And if I could bust out the Messiah right now, I would love to sing this. I can't read this passage without thinking of the beautiful lines from the Christmas uh, uh, Messiah that you hear all, every Christmas season. Every valley filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight. Isn't this beautiful? The rough way is smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. This was John the Baptist's role. But like I said, in a sense, it's our role too. We need to be making Christ available to people. People wonder a lot of times, what's my purpose? What's my, what, why am I here? Well, if you're a Christian, if your sins have been forgiven, if Jesus Christ has brought you into his family, well, this is a big part of it. You need to be that voice. You need to call out even when it's unpopular. Call out when you feel like you're the only voice that's calling out. In a sense, our job here on earth is to help make Christ available to people. Make it, make it easy for people to find Jesus. And now listen, not easy. I, this is very important. Not easy in the sense that we're dumbing down the gospel or making everything a quick sound bite. We, we, we don't, because people have short attention spans doesn't mean we can make the Bible uh, truth, the, the Christian truth, easy. This, these truths take time to develop, and we need to work at them. We need to dig. We need to, we need to search. We need to, we need to struggle for the truth. We need to train people to pay attention. Uh, so I'm not talking about making it easy by dumbing down the truth, not, not at all. And I don't mean we need to make Christ easy to find by betraying the gospel. You know what I'm talking about? The gospel of Jesus Christ is the cross of Christ. It says that all people are lost. Everybody is messed up. Everybody is broken. Everybody has this darkness in their heart, this sin. And you know it. When you want to do good, you want to be a good person, and something keeps pulling you down. And you find yourself saying things you wish you didn't say, and you find yourself thinking things that you know are wrong. And so you might try to make excuse of it. <coughs> well, well, this person, that person, this person. But at the end of the day, who's responsible for you? We're responsible for ourselves, right? And, and there's this wickedness, this wickedness inside of us. We can't stand around and talk about how good we are because it's a joke and it's a lie. The, devil's, the devil knows it's a lie, but he's happy for us to live there. God knows it's a lie, and he loves us too much for us to stay there. And we're living in self-deception if we keep telling ourselves how good we are. We need to understand our brokenness. Because the, the heart of the gospel is believing what God says. 
We need to believe what God says about himself. Brothers and sisters, we need to believe what God says about us. And God says we're made in his image. He loves us, but we've fallen, and we're not who we're supposed to be. Help me, Jesus. So what do we need? Well, we can't polish ourselves up. We can't make ourselves perfect. We can't make ourselves good enough to go to heaven. We can't reach up to heaven, so we need heaven to reach down to us. This is the gospel that God saw us in our messed up condition, and he came down to us anyways. God saw how broken we are, and he says, I love you. And he came down to us. He died on the cross. On the cross, all of our garbage, all of our nastiness was poured on him. He took all of our, our darkness upon himself. He paid the penalty for our sins. And then, we, and then by faith, we trust that God will forgive. And God is, is, is quick to forgive. He loves to forgive. He's waiting for people to turn to him because he wants to bring everyone into his family. So this is the gospel. The bad news, we're separated from God because we're messed up. The good news, Jesus did something about it. The cross, he came down for you and for I. Brothers and sisters, we need to bring the cross. And if we just bring, believe in Jesus, you'll be happy, wealthy, and fat because you're eating a lot of good food. If that's all we tell, tell people, if, if all we tell people is, is uh, boy, become a Christian, you'll giggle more or something. We are betraying the gospel. People need to know their brokenness before they'll want to see a physician. People need to know they're drowning before they'll accept help from a lifeguard. People need to know that their house is burning down all around them before they'll follow the fireman who's saying, come on, you got to get out of there. Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross, and we try to put the cross off the side because it's too bloody. We try to put the cross off the side so we can just tell people happy things and, and tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear and tell them how to you know, make a lot of money and have a bigger car, bigger house, bigger wife or whatever. Why? Why? How dare we? Thank you for being awake. How dare we? How dare we take the precious blood of Jesus Christ and say, we're going to hide that because we're afraid we'll scare people away. We want to talk about easy things. Do not betray the cross of Christ. Hold up the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the gospel, and it's what saves us from eternal separation from God. So not betraying the gospel, but I meant easy. We want to make it's easy for people to find Jesus in the sense, twofold, that we're not putting barriers up to people searching for truth. If somebody is desperate and they're hungry and they're looking for Jesus, we should not be putting barbed wire around the cross. I, I need forgiveness. I need God. I need somebody to care. I need some truth. I need something solid to hold on to. And we say, come to Jesus, and you have to vote Democrat. Come to Jesus, and you have to be a good Republican. That's like rap. You know what I'm doing here, right? I'm wrapping barbed wire around the cross. So if people want to embrace Jesus, now they have to embrace our politics. Uh, we, we, we wrap uh, barbed wire on the cross by, by putting politics in front of teaching or by making social work the primary focus. That if, if the, what is church? Well, it's all about social work. Where's the cross? Can't find it. We put distance between the cross and people. As important as caring for people is, how about pushing American culture on people? How about you're a missionary and you go overseas, and instead of holding up Jesus, you have to say, now you have to be a good American. And if you're a good American, now you can be a Christian. How about, and I, listen, I'm thankful for Christian music and whatnot, but I don't understand Christian hairstyles. You turn on, you turn on uh, Christian television, and it seems like, Christians on television have hairstyles that nobody else has. Uh, uh, listen, but I'm not, uh, I'm not saying, you know what? I'm not saying we all have to have the same kind of hairstyle. Yeah. Uh, there, there's this expectation with clothes and jokes, and sometimes Christian humor is like totally different. Ways of talking, and the idea is people have to become clones 
and act a certain way just to be a Christian. And that's wrapping barbed wire around the cross. Uh, let the gospel offend. We don't want to be the ones that are offending. Let the gospel offend. I'm going to speak bold truth, and if that offends you, I can't change that because that's the gospel. That's the truth of the Bible. But if I'm pushing my abrasive personality or I'm pushing, or if I'm telling Bob, everybody, you've got to have a haircut like mine, then you would be correct. Uh, if we're taking our situation and making people have to be like that in order to find Jesus Christ, boy, we're putting ourselves in front of the cross. We're making people come to us, making people act just like us before they can become a Christian. But filling in the valleys and leveling the mountains so that all people can see God's salvation is more than just not doing these things. It also includes actively doing things like John the Baptist was doing. If we care about bringing Christ to our world, and by the way, this is a good time to pause and ask yourself, do I care about bringing Christ to the world? Because it's easy to say, yeah, theoretically, but ain't nothing going to change in my life. Yeah, I want people to know Jesus, but I want somebody else to tell them about it, not me. I, I, like, in what sense is this a priority? In, in what level is this, is this uh, important for us? If we truly care about bringing Christ to our world, we need to speak the truth. Our culture does not like to hear the truth. Uh, culture does not want to hear the truth. Uh, when you speak the truth of God, it's almost like everything you see on a sitcom, almost, almost everything, and I'm exaggerating here, I understand, but what we see on television, what we hear on the radio, it's almost always pushing this anti-God agenda, anti-God mentality, and when we speak about truth, that there is a God, that his ways are better than our ways, and that he loves us so much if we repent, turn from our selfish ways, turn from our self-orientation, and orient our lives around him, he will accept and forgive. The world doesn't like to hear that. Trust me, you can talk theoretically about God, and in a lot of contexts, that's okay. Talk about a philosophical God. Talk, talk about a theological God. Talk about a God who's distance. Talk about a God who affects American culture and whatnot. And a lot of people will, will, will entertain that conversation. But talk about Jesus Christ who loved you enough to die for your sins. Suddenly, there's a lot of defense goes up. I was just talking to Adam about this this week. You cannot see magnetism. We know magnetism is there by what it attracts and what it repels. The name of Jesus Christ has this incredible effect of attracting some and repelling others. You just bring Jesus in the conversation. And it's so scary. You can talk about Buddha. You can talk about uh, Muhammad. You can talk about God. In general, you can talk about Thor. And yet, when we talk about Jesus, everybody understands this is a little more personal. This is a little more serious. There's something to this. We need, if we care about people going to heaven, there's no way to get around speaking the truth. Isn't that hard to hear? Isn't that difficult? Because we want just to be good people. I'm a good person, and, and uh, people will, <laughs> I'm a good person, and, and people will think I'm a good person, and I want to be liked, and I want to be popular, and I don't want people to look down at me, and I don't want this to cost me anything. You know, Jesus Christ said, "Leave your nets behind. I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men." They say, "Well, can I have fun with the fishing part and not leave my former life behind?" No. If we actually care about somebody else's soul, we need to love their soul more than our own comfort zone. Brothers, sisters, this is a hard message on purpose because I want us to, to always be a church that's eager to find ways to share the truth, to share the love of God, to bring people into the kingdom. Let's be looking for opportunities to win people to Christ. We need to... If we're going to fill in those valleys and level those mountains so that everybody can see God's salvation, we need to speak the truth. We need to put the spotlight on Jesus. Uh, I thought about just hiding behind the pulpit and talking so that you wouldn't see me. Uh, but then I realized that just draws more focus and it kind of defeats the purpose. 
You and I can't save anybody. We can't. Our words are weak. We never do things exactly the way we think they should, or, or actually they should. But Jesus Christ can save anybody. The worst sinner, the most selfish person, the most messed up, self-righteous, judgmental person can be loved and embraced and changed by the Holy Spirit. We can't save anybody, and we need to remember we're not the saviors. We need to keep putting that spotlight on Jesus. And everybody who's given a testimony here so far, what did I keep saying? Talk about your struggles, but keep it brief. Put the spotlight on Jesus. Put the spotlight on Jesus. Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who transforms. We need to, we need to introduce people to Jesus Christ because just knowing Dan Wolf does not save somebody from eternal damnation. We need them to know Jesus Christ, the risen Savior who died for their sins and rose again because nothing can stop him. And if death can't stop him, your sin is not going to stop him. My sin is not going to stop him. He can break through. He can make a way. He can get into that person's life and do what you and I cannot do. We need to speak truth to the powers that be. Again, this is uncomfortable. So we need, to, we need to speak the truth about sin. We need to put the spotlight on Jesus. And now we need to be brave to speak truth to power, political power, even that when that's difficult for us. I call this pop powers, pop powers, pop culture. Pop culture is so powerful. American, American military is, is so powerful. American politics is so powerful. But American culture is spread all over the world. And I'll tell you what, our culture loves to point fingers. And our culture loves to call people heretics. And our culture loves to have spasms. <gasps> you don't agree with popular culture about this? <gasps> How dare you say premarital sex is a sin? How dare you judge anybody? You do realize you're judging, right? Say anything that our culture has decided is differently on, and you will catch flack. John the Baptist spoke truth to power. How about Facebook? Oh, boy. I'm going to catch a lot of flack for this one. Uh, delete. No. How about that? You ever feel that war inside you? Am I going to represent Christ? Or am I just going to be popular? Or at least not as despised as, as normally. Religious power. Religion is powerful. You ever heard people say, well, I don't go to church, but I'm spiritual. You ever hear people say, well, I, I'm a Christian because I do this religious thing, that religious thing, this religious thing. And our job is to bring Jesus Christ into the conversation, to bring the truth of the cross into the conversation. It's not enough to be spiritual, whatever vague, whatever that means. It's not enough to be religious and ceremonial and, and do a lot, all these rituals. We need to bring the, the living God into every situation. Brothers and sisters, which of the prophets was popular? We're not called to popularity. I kind of wish I was. I'm not joking. <laughs> Whatever kind of power is out there, will we speak truth to it or will we cower like a bunch of sissies, run and hide because, because the majority says this is okay and we're saying, I think it's a sin. <laughs> I think the Bible says, no, I'm a coward. I'm a sissy. I'm just going to go along quietly. Speak truth to power. Jesus said of John the Baptist that until that time, no one ever born was greater than him. To follow John's example, we need to be fearless. And here's what I mean by fearless. Not that you don't have fear, that you go ahead and do what's right anyways because you're being empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're, you're being motivated and in, in, uh, pulled along by the Holy Spirit and you say, okay, I feel, I feel right now in my heart a tension that makes me want to run and hide. I'm going to choose the Lord, and I'm going to speak boldly. John the Baptist was willing to make serious sacrifices. 
care enough to dare enough? No. Let's see, where are we at? Now, probably none of us will ever be called to live in the desert, in the wilderness like John the Baptist. But where you do live, where you decide to buy your home, where you decide to get your apartment, where you put down your roots, may very well depend on your willingness to serve God in a particular community. I'm going to serve God here. I'm going to put down my roots here. I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to this community. John the Baptist was, was in the wilderness. Our communities are like wildernesses where there's so many people who, who uh, aren't living lives of gratitude to Jesus Christ. Probably none of us will be expected to wear camel skin clothes, although if it's anything like snake skin, it might be cool. Probably none of us are expected to wear camel skin clothes or eat locusts. There, there's actually some debate whether it was kind of a locust plant or actually grasshoppers. Either way, I prefer a better diet. <laughs> Probably we're not going to be uh, asked to dress like John the Baptist wearing these camel skins and eating wild locusts. But listen, how you dress should be affected by your faith. What you eat should be reasonably affected by our desire to bring Christ to, to everyone. And none of us are probably going to have our heads cut off, more than likely, by a puppet king of the Roman Empire. See how I qualified that? But if we dare to speak unpopular truths, you may get your head cut off on some internet forum. You may get your head cut off by, by people in the workplace saying, this is a loser. I'm tired of this person. I'm sick of that person. We might not get some Roman dictator to chop our heads off, but people might look down on you. Seriously. People might think less of you. They might respect you less. They might dismiss you. They might laugh at you. That is no fun. When people laugh at you, pray, God, help me to love this person. Every time people laugh at you, pray, God, help me to love this person. People may despise you even as you're trying to love them. And you're looking at this person saying, God's given me love for this person, and they hate my guts. And, and you're online dealing with somebody who all they want to do is make you go home and cry, and you're trying to love this person and care about them. Do it, because that's what God calls us to do. Brothers and sisters, uh, this is a challenging message, isn't it? What? It's going to get worse. What sacrifices will we accept to prepare the way of the Lord in southern Wisconsin? Everybody here is thinking, I should have left two minutes ago. What sacrifices are we willing to meet? Do we care about this city? Do we want to grab this city in, the, in Beloit and Milton and Edgerton? Do we want to grab this place for Jesus? Do we want to see thousands of people getting saved? Do we want to see people's lives being turned around and giving testimonies just like Toriano gave today? Well, what am I willing to do to see that happen? What am I willing to do to make paths straight to Jesus, to straighten out crooked paths and make rough roads smoother? John was called to be faithful. He wasn't called to a life of ease. He wasn't called to a ministry where everyone would love him or respect him. He wasn't promised a long life filled with earthly success. And John didn't sweet-talk people with a nice, easygoing, happy-go-lucky message. Let's look what John has to say, verse 7. And John said to the crowds coming out to be baptizing, baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Now, J. Vernon McGee said, Normally, I would not encourage pastors to say this congregation. However, in many churches, this would be entirely appropriate. You brood of vipers, who told you to get right with the Lord? Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And the idea is in that, you know, when you're burning brush or something, you'd see snakes come running out of the brush or coming up out of their holes, and they just all go running because they're trying to get away from the flame. Who warned you snakes? Who warned you to escape? The wrath of God is coming, and they're coming to John to be baptized, and he says, who warned, who, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do you see what he did? 
He first identified people as wicked, and secondly, he's saying, now live God's way. Isn't it so easy to just make a nice, smooth, smiley, easy message? It's, it's easier to build a big church that way. It really is. So I've got a choice whether I want to be faithful to this or not. Uh, I'm pausing, but I'm really not doubting right now that much. Uh, <laughs> then he's preaching a difficult message. Listen, brothers and sisters, God hates divorce. Listen, brothers and sisters, no shacking up before marriage. God wants you to be pure until you're married. Listen, brothers and sisters, don't lie. God does, God, God is, there's no shadow of, of deceit in him. He doesn't want us to lie. Now, I'm not telling these things to put the law on you. I'm saying this is how God wants his children to act. You know, in our family, it's not about legalism. We love our kids. We absolutely adore our children. And yet, in the wolf family, here's the way the wolf kids are supposed to behave. In God's family, he's not pushing the law on us. He freed us from the law. But he's saying, now, this is the way I want my children to live. Does that make sense to you? It's not pushing us back underneath the law. It's showing us how now we should live in our freedom. And it's not by being subjugated to sin once again. Does that make sense? No? All right, all right. Produce, verse 8, produce uh, fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Well, you know what the equivalent is today? Well, I grew up in a Christian family. Or even, I'm an American. This is a Christian nation. Of course I'm a Christian. That doesn't fly with God. You are not a Christian because your grandma was a Christian. You're not a Christian because your, your, your best friend is a Christian. You're not a Christian because your sister is a Christian. You're not a Christian just because you grew up in America. Listen to what, listen what John the Baptist says to these Jewish people who are the people of God, who had the promises of God. And they were saying, we, we have Abraham as our father. And John the Baptist says, for I tell you, out of a bunch of dumb rocks, gods can make children of Abraham. Being an American, being born in a Christian family, does not make you a follower of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, the axe is already at the root of the tree. The axe is resting on the tree, the axe of judgment that's going to bring total destruction, total destruction of that tree. It's going to chop it away. The axe is already there. The wrath of God is coming. Get right with Jesus. Get right with Jesus. The axe is already at the foot of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And the people said, what shall we do then? Now see what happens? When you preach the truth, some people are going to run away, but some people are going to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. And they're going to say, what shall we do then? What's better? You have a crowd of 10,000 people, and nobody ever says, how do I get right with God? I'm a desperate sinner. Or you have a crowd of 1,000, and 600 run away when you start talking about Jesus. But the other 400 says, I need this. I need to get right with the Lord. Somebody save me. Well, I'll tell you what. All heaven rejoices when one sinner turns to God. There's a party in heaven when just one person surrenders their heart to the living God. When just one person says, Lord, forgive. There's a celebration in heaven. And this has eternal consequences. It's far better, far better that we speak the truth, even if it drives some people away. If, if only some people are going to go to heaven because we had the courage to speak the truth. Okay? So these people in verse 14 uh, says, what should we do? John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And everyone who has food should do the same. So John gets real practical right away. Here's what it looks like in God's kingdom. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Wow. Even t it's like, in our culture, it would be like saying, even Canadians were willing to come and find Jesus. Um, uh, even tax collectors came to be baptized. Uh, teacher, they asked, what should we do? Listen to what he says. Now, people in that culture, if you were a tax collector, you were like a collaborator with the Roman Empire. Tax collectors weren't just a, no a normal job. To be a, if you were a tax collector, you were with the occupying army. How would you feel if we were being occupied by ISIS? Or we were being occupied by, by a red China? And 
some people were working with the Chinese government as officials to collect the taxes. You, those are traitors. So these traitors, these guys who have betrayed their culture, go to John the Baptist and say, what should we do? You notice he doesn't say, you should not work with the government. You should not be collecting taxes. Instead, he says something I think made the rest of the crowds angry. He said, don't collect any more than you are required. In, order, in other words, don't rip the people off. You could, you, could, you, could, you could cheat them and make yourselves rich. You can rich yourself by taking more than you're supposed to and, and then giving the Roman government less. John the Baptist says, be fair with your taxes. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? Soldiers, uh, officers of the peace. Uh, they're, they're the symbols of, of, of the system, right? So he, of course he's going to tell them, get out of there. You can't be a, a good person and still be. No, that's not what he says. Soldiers asked him, what should we do? And he replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. In other words, don't plant evidence on people. Don't drop some drugs in the back of their car window or whatnot. Don't, don't uh, lie to get people convicted. And if you saw the news, the CIA was just revealed that they had been lying in a lot of their conviction cases. Uh, don't exhort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And now, isn't that interesting? God, God, I'm coming to you. This is a prophet of God. If you come to a prophet of God, you want to hear something big, right? Okay, I'm, I'm coming to John the Baptist. Give me something big. Give me, give me something. Give me something uh, that can change my life. I want to hear something big. And the prophet says, be content with your pay. No, 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 no. I want something fancy. I want something really, really huge and grandiose. And, and I want something that's going to make me feel like a big deal. And God, and this prophet, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, you need to learn about being content. Be content with your pay. So isn't this interesting? These, these soldiers came, and God, speaking to the prophet, didn't say, you have to get out of there. You can't be a police officer. You can't be a soldier. You can't. He doesn't say that. He says, be fair to people. Don't plant evidence and learn to be content. Isn't that interesting? Brothers and sisters, God's will for us, too. Don't cheat people. Be fair. Learn to be content. Now, quick side note. Uh, because as I was wrote, reading through there, I wonder what some of you thought, well, this sounds like works righteousness. This sounds like if I do this and this and this, then God will love me more. If I do this, then I can go to heaven. Maybe some of you thought this sounds like a gospel of, of works or, or a return to the law. This isn't uh, some message, though, that's out of sync with the rest of the gospel. Jesus himself said in John 14, 15, if you love me, then obey me. Hebrews eleven sixteen tells us without faith it is impossible to please God. See, if you want to obey God, see, you won't want to obey God unless you have faith. It's always been about faith. There's no such thing as a dichotomy. Sometimes people think in the Old Testament, God is one way, in the New Testament, he's another way. That's not true. We, that's why we took years to go through the Old Testament. You know what we saw again and again and again? Grace. We call it a drumbeat of grace. You just hear this grace, this drumbeat of grace going throughout the entire Old Testament. It's always been uh, that we're saved by the grace of God. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. He was not preaching grace. Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we said, faith is this fancy word. People think it's so religious and so supernatural and hocus pocus. And faith just means trust. Without trusting God, you can't please God. And you won't want to obey God unless you really trust him. It's always been about faith or trust, trusting in God. It's a myth that the ancient Israelites were saved by following a bunch of rules. Nobody has ever been saved by rules. In the Old Testament, the law didn't save anyone. It couldn't. It's not, that, it's not its purpose. The law can't save. Just think about this in terms of driving. You know, I'm not superstitious, but I almost feel superstitious saying this. I've never got a speeding ticket. I'm not superstitious. Um, <laughs> I've never gotten a speeding ticket. But you know what? If the police officer pulls me over speeding, they're not going to say, oh, you've had such a great record? Let me give you $600 for your great record. 
No, that's not the way the law works. The law doesn't award you for doing what you're supposed to do. The law punishes you when you fall short. So the law of God can't make us right from, with God because we're supposed to do that. You don't get credit for doing that. We're supposed to do that. So then when we fall short, that's where condemnation and judgment comes. So by doing the works of the law, nobody can be saved. It's actually impossible because the law can only condemn. In Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. This is Old Testament. Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord declared him righteous, just declared him righteous. He's going to be right with me because of his faith. See, even in the Old Testament, it wasn't works. It's always been about grace, but we receive grace by trusting in God. That's right, faith. If we don't trust God, we won't receive his grace. So the ancient Hebrews demonstrated their trust in God by saying, his ways are better than our ways. I'm going to follow his law. Trusting that his ways are always superior to our ways. See, they weren't saved by following the law. They showed that I believe God's ways are better, so I'm going to follow them. And when they fell short, it was grace that covered them. But they showed their faith by saying, I want to be obedient to God's will. John the Baptist was preparing people's hearts to receive Jesus, and he was teaching people how God's people should act. This is how we do it in the family. Not what to do in order to go to heaven. Instead, he was teaching them to produce fruit in their lives, and he said that is in keeping with the repentance that you say you've had. Produce fruit that is in keeping with repentance, and he says this is what that fruit looks like. Don't rip people off. Don't plant evidence. Don't tell lies. Uh, be be content with, with your situation. Uh, turning away from their own ways to God's light ways, because his ways are better than mine. See, it's not how you get saved. It's not what we're talking about. In the New Testament, it's still the same. It hasn't changed. We say the sinner's prayer and we get baptized. Did you know that those things don't save you? Water can't sa save you and a magic prayer can't save you. God's grace saves us. God's grace is the only thing that can save us. But praying to God, saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. And then taking this step of faith to get publicly baptized. These are ways that we confess that the Lord's ways are better than our ways. These are ways in the New Testament that we show that we're in agreement with God. We have faith that the Lord is right. So doing our best to follow God's ways doesn't save us. But what, saves, but what saved people today is what saved people all along. It's the grace of God, and we show our faith by, by committing ourselves to God's way. It's what it means to have faith. Don't tell me you've got a lot of faith, and I don't care what God says about that. I'm not going to do it. It seems to me that you don't have faith that God's ways is better. See where that come from? It's a fine line, but it's important. Works don't save us. But unless your heart has been stirred to say God's ways are better and I want to follow him, I don't see where the faith is. What is that faith? Where is the love if we say I love you, God, and I don't care what you have to say about my life? You're not going to take the grace unless you know you're a sinner, and you're not going to know you're a sinner unless you're disagreeing with God about your life. So, because of John's bold, spirit-filled, uncompromising message, people began to build him up in their minds and make a bigger deal out of him than they should have. Some people even started to wonder if he was the long-awaited Messiah. You ever notice how people can make a, 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 a political leader or a religious leader into kind of a, a Messiah figure, a savior figure? And here is where I think John the Baptist shows his true greatness. Even, even more than being a bold preacher, I think this is where his true greatness is. His heart wasn't looking to, to uh, aggrandize himself. His heart wasn't on personal greatness. His heart, what drove him, was he wanted to see people know Jesus. Let's look from verse 15 now. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might be the Messiah. John answered them all. He had a chance to be a big deal. Or he could have even had false humility and said, well, shucks, I'm not the Messiah. I'm just number two. 
I'm not, I'm not God of flesh, but I'm the guy who's given this important job to prepare the way for him. He doesn't do that. He said, John answered to all of them, I baptize with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This was like the lowest slave's job was to take off your grimy sandal after you've been walking on Roman roads where oxes and horses have gone before you. And the lowest slave would take off somebody's shoe. And John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to have the great honor of removing Christ's sandals. He, put, he puts himself down here. Christ is up here, we're down here, and he doesn't want any of God's spotlight. And Jesus said, this is a great man. I baptize with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, he's threshing the floor to gather the wheat into the barn, but he will burn up all the chaff with unquenchable fire. And this is the first picture of Jesus that we see uh, John the Baptist giving. How often do preachers preach a Jesus that looks like the Jesus that John the Baptist was preaching? And with many other words, John exhorted the people. This idea of exhortation, yeah, I don't like to be exhorted. You don't like to be exhorted. Whenever I do exhortation on Sunday mornings, there's a natural inclination to, I don't like that. John the Baptist exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them, all the good news that we've been talking about all morning. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all of the other evil things that Herod had done, Herod added to all this evil list by locking John up in prison, which goes to prove no good deed goes unpunished. God saw, God saw John the Baptist, right? Do you think John the Baptist was cursed because he ended up on jail? He did everything right. He, he gave up, his father was a priest, right? Working in the temple. He could have had a pretty cushy life. He gave it all up to go out in the wilderness and preach, to preach an unpopular message, although God worked powerfully through him and people were thronging to hear the truth. He ate locusts. He dressed unfashionably. You think if you make some sacrifices to God, God's going to honor that by giving me a long, healthy, happy life, right? I want you to answer this for me. Was John the Baptist cursed? No. God looked down. Heaven put the stamp of approval on him and said, nobody ever born up until this time is greater than John the Baptist. He's a great man, and he got his head cut off because the devil is the ruler of this world. He hated the message of this great man. And Herod, because he saw a little hoochie-coochie dance, said, I'll give you anything. And a great man was killed because some teenager did a dance that this wicked man liked and said, I'll give you anything. Of all the banal, ridiculous things to happen. And yet God was right there in heaven welcoming John the Baptist and saying, good job. Good job. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus declared that John was a great man. Brothers and sisters, hard message for me too. We don't want to live for earthly applause. Let's live for the applause of heaven. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.